Uh, welcome to our webinar this afternoon. We are going to be talking for the next hour about dyslexia assessments, and I'm going to pose to you a specific model that um, I find to be most effective, uh, really hitting on some of the key areas. And we have this specific webinar uh, for you all in California, uh, and I'll talk about that a little bit, uh, talk about why in a little bit, uh, why that's so important. Um, so you have a bunch of your colleagues online uh, right now with you across the state. And we are also going to be recording this for anybody that may want to watch this again or if you want to send this along to some of your colleagues uh, later on. Just as a quick disclosure, just so you all know, um, I am an employee of Pearson. I'm a school psychologist by training, as Sherry mentioned. Um, but I will be talking about dyslexia assessment um, and mentioning Pearson assessments, just so you are all aware that that's, uh, that's what I'm going to be talking about. Um, but I'm going to be talking about this model of dyslexia assessment that can be applied with various uh, types of assessments in a toolkit. So um, don't get hung up on necessarily the assessments that I'm talking about, more or less the process. Um, and, and as we go along, hopefully that will become clear. Um, as I see several folks in the chat box are putting in questions about handouts, um, they were sent out to everyone that has registered uh, on this email. It would have been sent out to a general list that every, of all the attendees. Um, so, you, you know, you might not have received it just because sometimes um, uh, your, your school or company servers may slow up email coming through or it may have gone through spam. So please check those um, at your leader. It's not necessary for today, um, but it, it will be helpful if you want to go through and kind of review this later on. Here's our agenda. It is a, it is a very um, uh, ambitious hour, so let's see if I can get through uh, most of what I have on our agenda for today. Uh, you know, there, there is a, uh, an additional reference I want to make. Uh, I have it listed here at the bottom of the agenda slide, which is um, the, the, uh, the Pearson Clinical Assessment Dyslexia Toolkit white paper that is published on our website. Uh, you can go to, our, to the uh, pearsonclinical.com website to reference that. Uh, it's a white paper that was written by uh, one of our research directors and uh, our product manager, uh, Tina, who's actually on the line right now with us uh, managing the chat box. Um, but you can go there and, and reference this as, if you'd like as well. A lot of the, the, the methodology and the examples that I'll be giving um, can be found in that, that, that uh, white paper. Here are some of the learner outcomes. I won't dwell on these too long, but basically we will be talking about a model. I'm going to talk about screening and assessment as a process, right? So um, really I want you to be able to think about that um, from beginning to end a little bit more in detail. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about how to interpret the screening and assessment findings and really where you should go next, giving some scenarios that may help you uh, with your uh, decisions for dyslexia assessment. But before we get started, do you mind answering this question for me? I just want to get a sense of who all we have in the room. Um, what is your professional role most closely related to? Uh, I don't even know it's not completely um, um, exhaustive here, but just whatever your, your role is most closely, please submit that on the screen. Give you another quick minute to finish that up. All right, so we have a good mix. Um, good mix between most uh, school psychologists, administrators, speech pathologists, um, special education teachers, dyslexia specialists. Great. All right, well, welcome. I think this is going to be applicable to all of you. And, you know, if you really think about the way that we talk through our uh, a model of this, this hybrid model or this uh, best practice model for assessment, it is, it is something that incorporates um, multiple professional viewpoints, and um, it's very important that we maintain that level of interprofessional um, collaboration with dyslexia. Um, the research that we're talking about, um, and if you read about research about in, uh, assessment and, and treatment or intervention for dyslexia specifically, best practices that we incorporate or integrate multiple viewpoints. So um, I'm glad you could all join us today. And this really is, this slide here, I just uh, threw these, these two slides, uh, these two um, images together because it really highlights one of the reasons why we're here today. Um, on the right-hand side, you can see the California Dyslexia Guidelines that were put out in, um, I believe, September, or um, recently. Um, I'm not exactly sure which month they came out. It was recent within the past uh, three or four months, I believe, uh, of 2017. So there are specific guidelines now for California that drive um, practice in school. So it's important that we take that into consideration. And I know I've been out to California recently um, talking to some folks um, about assessment. I mean, they were very concerned about 
um, the process that their school system should put into place for best practice assessment. That really comes full, cir full circle around to the reason why we here at Pearson are presenting this, which is we are uh, an assessment, Pearson Clinical Assessment. We are the, the world's largest clinical assessment company, and we are experts in the field of assessment. So what we want to be able to do today is be able to provide you with a model that can help um, you interpret your guidelines within the framework for assessment from beginning to end. And here on the left-hand side, I just threw in a little uh, little picture here of your own Lieutenant Governor, Gavin Newsom. Um, and he's actually in that picture with uh, uh, Dr. Sally Shea, who's an author of ours, and her husband, Bennett, on the, on the right-hand side there. Um, they are an authors of a, of a screener that we use to see with dyslexia screen. Um, but I watched a, a, a YouTube video of him recently talking about um, his experience with dyslexia. He is a, a person with dyslexia, and he, he uh, was very, very good at discussing um, his challenges and how he overcame them and, and uh, what his school and his parents did well for him growing up. So if you haven't seen that, I would just suggest you go into Google and uh, shoot in Gavin Newsom and dyslexia webinar, dyslexia YouTube or something like that, and you'll be able to find it. But it's a really great, a really great video to watch. So let's start out. Let's talk about what dyslexia is so we're all on the same page. To do that, I want to start first by looking at what typical, um, uh, what is a typical pathway for the development of reading skills. Now, I realize that this list is not exhaustive. It is a general list. But in general, it's important for us to re recognize um, how we develop skills from beginning to end. And we have to start first by thinking about those pre-reader skills. Yes, we develop skills in reading and language before ever being able to read, of course. Um, those are things like letter identification, rhyming, um, uh, the identification of letters and phonemes and spoken words. So when you hear something, being able to break it down. This is before you even get to looking at um, um, the written words, written language. Um, then we start to develop a letter sound correspondence, which develops into a sight word development, uh, which you know, is really dependent a lot on, on, um, on memory. Um, we have folks who, uh, young children who cannot develop, um, who cannot you know, identify um, sounds and words yet, um, and they have a great sight word vocabulary, and that really is mostly because of their, their memory. But um, a lot of times when sight word development first brings in or comes into play in kindergarten, um, we, are, we are helping them with sounding out words too, so really breaking down that barrier of fluency. So when we think about the development of sight words, it's important for us uh, to really uh, start with that early on because the more sight words a child has, the less they have to depend on sounding them out. And um, then children decode new words accurately and fluently, really transferring oral language vocabulary into that written language vocabulary. Remember that that starts first, and it's important for us to remember that reading first starts with it is language, so it first starts as oral language transferring then into the written. Um, we start to integrate word decoding into sentence comprehension, and then finally reading for comprehension occurring somewhere around grade three or four. But it is important, again, as I mentioned, for us to go back and remember that reading is ultimately language. If you look on the left-hand side, if we think about the development of language, and uh, for those speech pathologists on the, on the line, I know that this is a very rough um, estimation of how this occurs, and there are many more steps in here. Um, but essentially, we develop language by ear, which is a receptive oral language, listening first. You know, we develop language by mouth or expressive oral language, followed by uh, the written language components, which are uh, the receptive reading component, language by eye, and receptive ex or expressive written language, which is writing or language by hand or motion. So it, it, it occurs in this general fashion. So in any situation where we have a child who has difficulty with um, the oral language side of the developmental pathway, um, we then do tend to see difficulties or weaknesses on the written language. So oral language is a necessary component of building written language. But we see that um, children who don't have oral language development tend to develop written language at a much lower um, so it's important that we go back to this and remember that reading is absolutely language. So when we define dyslexia, um, I, I, this is a, a hybrid. Uh, you know, I talk a lot about hybrid in today's uh, presentation, but this is a hybrid definition of dyslexia, really um, melting two together, which is uh, two of the major um, um, definitions that you will see out there coming from the International Dyslexia Association um, and coming from also 2015 um, a Senate resolution 
that uh, was looking at defining and really getting into more more into detail on on dyslexia in um, in national politics. So it's important that we can kind of bring these together. And I think they're really good on their own, um, but but bringing them together also does make it a little bit more clear to me. Um, the first point is that it's important for us to realize that it is a specific learning disability and it is neurobiological in origin. That's undisputable, um, we, and I'll go over that on the next slide, uh, but it is important to remember that uh, there is a brain-based uh, reason why uh, kids have difficulty with, with reading. Um, it is also then considered an unexpected difficulty in that um, you know, it, it tends to be the case where, you know, this isn't always the case, but it is. it does tend to be the case where individuals um, have ability to be a much better reader, uh, but then con continue to fail to read. Number three, I already did said they had this language basis, so that's something we need to remember. Um, it's characterized by difficulties with accurate and or fluent word recognition, poor spelling, decoding abilities. Um, it is phonological in, in origin. Um, it is resulting from deficits in that phonological component of language. Um, and then oftentimes the transfer of phonological component into the orthographic um, so it is often unexpected in relation to other cognitive abilities, as I mentioned earlier, and also in light of the provision of effective classroom instruction. I have it, this listed here. Let me highlight it because it's so important that we remember that this occurs in light of instruction or treatment that is considered effective. Um, some secondary consequences oftentimes include uh, difficulties with reading comprehension, of course, um, uh, although we do oftentimes see kids have decent comprehension given their other abilities. So let's say they have really well-developed uh, listening comprehension or other cognitive abilities. They sometimes um, can, 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 uh, can, can make stride with reading comprehension even though they're, they're not, um, you know, their reading comprehension in general is affected by their overall reading. So it's important to remember that. And again, it's not often not always present with an uneven cognitive profile. Um, we oftentimes see peaks and valleys in kids' profiles with regard to uh, their skills over time. With regard to the neurobiology, this is something coming from um, two preeminent re researchers in the field, Sally and, and, and Bennett Shaywitz um, out of the Yale uh, Child Study Center, um, really showing the neural signature for dyslexia. If we look here on the left-hand side um, and we look at the non-impaired, uh, a brain pathway for the non-impaired readers, um, we tend to see a pathway that includes um, not only Broca's and the Prado temple areas, but also Wernicke's area. So essentially what we're looking at is a pathway that, in, that invokes um, the, the articulation and vocalization of words uh, with word analysis and recognition or automaticity. So you see a pathway that really, inc that really incorporates uh, multiple areas um, of the brain. And this tends to be the case whenever we look at learning whenever we look at any cognitive skill for that matter, any academic skill for that matter. It doesn't tend to be housed in one area of the brain. It tends to be a pathway that invokes multiple skills. And that's pretty clear in this, in this uh, left hand, uh, the non-impaired brain um, um, illustration. And if we look here on the right hand side, we see that um, we tend to see um, activation mostly in Broca's area, in the vocalization articulation area, and not as much activation or little to less activation um, in, in the word recognition, automaticity, word analysis areas. And, you know, those tend to be the areas where we start to see the analysis of visual, uh, visual um, um, stimuli, the, uh, the transfer of chronological into the orthographic visual components. Um, so that tends to be what we're seeing in terms of the brain differences between non-impaired and dyslexic individuals. So the neurobiology or the background of that is fairly clear. With regard to California, I pulled this out of uh, Title V, the California Code of Regulations, uh, with regard to um, bringing the term dyslexia into schools, because for quite some time, the term dyslexia was specifically left out of um, educational legislation. Um, and that became very difficult. Um, oftentimes we'd see um, in schools, we'd see medical diagnoses coming in for dyslexia. We have difficulty in terms of transferring that into the um, into the educational diagnostic speak, right? So, what, well, how did that fit into our into our processes? Well, in your codes for California, dyslexia is specifically mentioned as 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 a condition that can lead to specific learning disabilities. So, it's 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 right there, and that really does um, it does really sort of um, um, stride over or, or leap over that boundary for you. But also, a lot of times, um, you know, 
coming in as a medically diagnosed condition or from the clinical world, uh, students can also qualify for a 504 plan if, um, if necessary. So in terms of medical diagnosis, I did have a question that came through. Um, a lot of times the medical diagnosis is coming from um, uh, you know, clinical assessments, so neuropsychological assessments. Um, pediatricians sometimes will provide that diagnosis based on, um, based on um, interview and other test data, um, but it, it oftentimes come from, comes from um, clinical psychology or neuropsychology. With regard to the assessment of dyslexia in children, let's talk about this best practice assessment model. Um, there are a couple of primary components I want to start with before we actually get into the meat of it, which is the first part is, is that we have to have more than one data point. It's always so, so important that we don't just look at one specific criterion to determine whether or not a weakness is apparent in a certain area. The reason for that is if we have one specific or one single data point, that's really prone to a lot of measurement error over time, and it's not very stable. So essentially, we have to have at least one data point multi taken multiple times. So if you are measuring, um, uh, you know, um, sight word vocabulary, let's just say, from time one, if we use that as a data point, fine. We use this data point number two, um, you know, six months later or three months later as data point number two. It's important that we at least have multiple, multiple points of that data, but it is also important that we take two different data points or two different criterion to validate a specific weakness. Um, however, I always put this one in here, which is the third bullet, don't over-collect, analyze, or interpret. So don't look for, don't just throw out a net and try to get as much as you can into that net. It's important that we don't just, just collect, 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 and over-interpret data. That tends to lead us down a pathway of over-interpretation, and um, I, I highly suggest against, against it. So find two, possibly three data points that will co uh, corroborate or um, uh, basically uh, confirm uh, what your findings are um, and move on. And the second one is that we're looking at multiple sources of information. So don't just take a child's um, performance in the classroom and, and run with that. It's important that we take multiple sources, um, parent data, um, history, family history, um, looking at specific test data, looking at classroom artifacts. We have to be able to take information from multiple sources in this situation. And also that number two, which again is super, super important when we're looking at any um, assessment of learning disabilities or learning in general, but also in particular for dyslexia, which is um, look at how well the student responds to effective instruction or intervention. Here is, um, here is a model that I want you to start to think about, which is when we look at dyslexia, I want you to think in terms of three general areas. I want you to think in terms of symptoms, I want you to think in terms of the causes or correlates, what can be the underlying condition or underlying reason. And I also want you to think in terms of risk factors. Uh, I have the arrows going back and forth between each of these because this is an interactive model, right? So we have to think about the risk factors um, being, being present. Uh, we have to think about the symptoms that a child is exhibiting with relationship to why are they occurring. So uh, what is causing those symptoms to occur? So let's break each of those areas down a little bit more in detail. Symptoms is, quite frankly, I have this little picture down here of the child sneezing, is exactly just that. Um, what I want you to think about first before we move into the details here is symptoms can be related to or can, can be caused by many different things. So if I'm sitting here thinking that a symptom is the actual deficit, that would be erroneous. I want you to think about this is what we're seeing. This is the outcome or the output that we're seeing. So I want you, the first point is really to re remember that word instruction is considered an important symptom, but it's not enough. Um, so just lack of response to any intervention or lack of response to proper instruction is not, uh, is not sufficient to meet this, uh, this, this criteria. We do break it down into term, in terms of pre-reader and reader symptoms because, again, remember, as I mentioned, the development of reading occurs prior to actually becoming a reader. So symptoms in the pre-reader, um, difficulties with alphabet writing, difficulties with letter identification and or phonics, so that letter sound correspondence. Once we move into the reader level or at the reader level, um, we start to see difficulties with decoding pseudo words, word reading, uh, reading fluency is difficult, the oral reading fluency in particular, um, spelling is difficult as well as written expression, and additionally, reading comprehension is oftentimes relatively poor compared to listening 
So these are the symptoms that we see in children, both at the reader and pre-reader level. Then we move into what would be causing those symptoms to occur. So cognitive processes or cognitive skills are not as easily observed. Right? We have to actually assess these using very spe specific, highly specialized tools and assessments. Um, and we have to be able to contribute to our overall, our overall hypothesis, right? So if I'm looking at a symptom, I want to be able to link that symptom to one of the causes or correlates, okay? And they're not as easily observed. When we think back, um, IDA put out some, um, some guidelines also in 2016, and they considered phonological process and rapid automatic naming, auditory working memory. They considered those to be key for dyslexia evaluation. Yes, they are key, but there are also other causes or correlates that we have to take into consideration, including processing speed, um, long-term long storage and retrieval, uh, so memory storage and retrieval, associative memory, and then orthographic processing. So there are some, there are four additional components that we suggest be part of a dyslexia evaluation because they absolutely do or can cause the symptoms that we see. And when we break down risk factors, I want you to remember or, or at least start our thinking about risk factors that if we combine these hereditary, hereditary or correlated risk factors, with the behavioral symptoms, such as uh, we saw in the previous two slides, the behavioral symptoms and the causes and correlates, that's really what we consider a robust assessment. We have to take into consideration the, the risk factors when we're, when we're interpreting overall uh, a child's reading difficulties to determine whether or not dyslexia is part of that. So that includes family history. We know that there's a high correlation of dyslexia um, or high preponderance of dyslexia across families. Uh, we also know that low scores on a dyslexia screening test, um, the screening tests are made to help differentiate um, risk and at risk, uh, at risk and not at risk uh, uh, classification. So low scores on those, on those tests could also be risk factors, as well as, um, as, well as uh, language impairment, you know, so poor receptive vocabulary. That's an important consideration as well. In light of all that, we have to consider possible strengths because Possible strengths do occur, and this goes back to what I mentioned earlier with regard to the, um, the uneven cognitive profile. We tend to see peaks and valleys, strengths and weaknesses in their, in their profiles. So we oftentimes see relative strengths in fluid reasoning and problem solving, more of the, the executive function component. Um, oral language can oftentimes be a strength in, in children with dyslexia, so listening, speaking, vocabulary, grammar, and math. Math also tends to be a strong um, Whenever we're developing interventions and strategies, it's always important to go back and remember that the most effective interventions and, uh, and, and curriculum and strategies are based on cognitive strengths. So if we know that they have cognitive strengths, we should, uh, we should base our intervention on there. So if we think about that, uh, if we think about the components that make up dyslexia, what is dyslexia, the symptoms, the causes, the risk factors, how do we assess for that in your, how do we, well, how do we transfer that into your school building to make sure that we're effectively identifying, um, educating, treating all of the students that come through your, your building? That's a very complex process. What I want us to do is follow the SAIM framework, the screen, assess, intervene, and monitor framework. And I think that this, this framework really does prove to be um, very effective across time, but we have to make sure we take into consideration effective components at each of the levels. So first, let's start with screening. To start there, I need to talk about why we use a screen. Well, it's pretty clear in some situations, but um, especially when it's mandated. Um, but um, the, the two primary reasons are because a lot of times, large numbers of kids need to be evaluated, and we need to be able to meet that district of state, state, uh, state criteria. And screeners allow us to assess um, at, at a large, uh, at a larger level, at a more comprehensive level. Also, number two here is going back, really thinking about how well our referral process uh, functions. Oftentimes, referral processes show um, very poor hit rate. So, whatever our referral process is may not identify or may not lead to a lot of special education classifications. Um, so really that's a, a poorly established uh, referral process. And number three here I think is probably the most important, that's why I have it bolded actually, so 
intervening early on dyslexia specifically, because that's what we're talking about here today, has benefits for, for prognosis. We know that there's a huge achievement gap that occurs um, and it starts in early education, and we also know that that persists, persists all the way through high school if children are not um, addressed early enough. So there's a lot of support for us identifying dyslexia early enough and you're intervening in order to uh, close that achievement gap. So that's really, really important. However, this is our stop sign, our slow down. Be careful because we have uh, to consider the limitations of the screen. Screeners do not provide a diagnosis. Remember, they do not provide a diagnosis. They are screening measures. They should not be used to identify the degree of impairment or strengths or weaknesses, a pattern of strengths or weaknesses. That's super important to remember. Screeners are just that. They're supposed to help us screen out weaknesses, um, or difficulties in certain areas. So I want you to remember that if you're pulling a, a screener to drive diagnosis, it likely is an in, improper use of Okay, remember why screeners are developed. Um, and that diagnostic component should be left for more diagnostic tests, uh, more comprehensive level tests. Screeners are not comprehensive by name. So it's important that we remember that. So it, it's also important to remember that screeners can be either performance-based or rating-based. So let me give you some examples of what that looks like. Here are some examples, both universal and tier two. Um, on the first, uh, the first five bullets up there are Pearson um, assessments, Pearson screeners, and the others, are, um, the other five are from other other companies. So there are some examples up here of both performance-based and ratings-based. So let's just go over um, ours at Pearson, just because that's what an expert in those. <laughs> so if we look at, look at um, bullets uh, four or two through five, those are all considered performance-based. So, for example, Ames Web Plus is going to give um, um, uh, probes. It's going to give benchmarking assessments where a child is actually taking um, some assessment and we are gathering scores and data on that. Um, the KT3 and YS3 dyslexia index scores requires children to actually take some, uh, certain subtests. So those, those are considered performance or behavioral assessments. Um, I can contrast that with something like the Shaywitz dyslexia screen, which is a teacher rating form. So while we're looking at specific skill here on the bottom four, on the top one for the Shaywitz, we are looking at um, we are looking at a teacher giving their professional rating of a child after six to eight weeks of certain questions, uh, based on certain questions that were found to be effective at differentiating between two groups. So we're not looking at skills, we're looking at ratings of certain areas that we know differentiate between people who have or who are at risk for dyslexia and people who are not at risk for dyslexia. So there's a little bit of a difference, right? But what do we, what do, we do? How do we integrate the both of those? How do we integrate a ratings-based and performance-based measure to, to effectively screen? I'm going to give you that in a second. I'll just show you this slide real quick. I'm not going to go over this in too much detail, but it is important for us to, to when we're looking at screener choice, to think about a couple things. First of all, we have to take into consideration our resources. And what I mean by resources are time and money, basically. So how much time do we have to put into the screening process? Um, how much uh, 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 or what level of professional resources do we need? So what I mean by that is, uh, can a teacher complete this quickly? Does it require a speech pathologist or a, a school psychologist to, um, to give highly specialized assessments? Um, how much time does the child spend out of class? Um, do I need to see them face to face? Those types of things. And we have to take, the, we have to take that into consideration with how, how, how specific, uh, sensitive and specific do we need these assessments to be? So, uh, you know, do I need to be able to uh, weed out uh, or identify a lot of students? Um, do I want to have, what, what are the implications if I miss some? What are the implications if I have too many students identified as a potential weakness? I'm going to say that, and, and, I, and I stand by this uh, professional opinion, which is that if we over-identify kids being at risk for reading difficulties, the potential, uh, potential impact of those is minimal. And the reason I say that is because if I have, um, if I have, if I'm identifying an additional three to five percent in my building of kids that have reading difficulties, what happens 
Well, in those situations, if we're effectively managing and monitoring that data, we should be giving them some level of intervention or some more highly specialized reading um, um, uh, instruction. So essentially, if they have difficulties with reading and we're giving them more services to improve their reading at an early level, the benefit, the, there are more potential benefits. The benefits outweigh the potential impact. Okay, so that's why I say that. Um, essentially, what we want to look at here, I'm not going to go over this in too much detail um, because uh, th th this is a lot of psychometrics that I don't want to uh, go too far into the weeds on. But again, feel free to go and look at that white paper that I mentioned at the beginning of today's uh, uh, webinar to get additional de uh, details about this. You can read about um, how uh, the research director, Christina Bro and Tina, uh, wrote about uh, these, these specific um, tests or index scores. But essentially what I want to be able to show you are, are, are two things. The first one is the effect size category. So the effect size, um, the, the column, I'm sorry, the effect size column, what that shows is um, effect size is collected after clinical sample, uh, clinical study. So essentially what we did was uh, you give the test to um, a sample of um, non-impaired readers and you give a sample uh, to a sample of impaired readers or at risk for impairment readers. And we see the, the ability of that test to differentiate between those two groups. And effect sizes, generally effect sizes of uh, over 0 .8, uh, 0 0.80 and above are considered uh, um, good at differentiating between two groups. So if we look at these effect sizes here of 1.48, 0 0.96, 0 1.47, 2.11, 1.79, if we see every single effect size is listed in this column, is considered um, very high and very effective at differentiating between the clinical and the non-clinical groups. Additionally, I want you to look at the AUC, which is the area under the curve estimate. I'm not going to get into too much about what that is, but effectively what that does is it differentiates between chance, uh, chance identification and not chance identification. So 0.5 would be considered chance identification. 1.0 means uh, identification uh, in every situation. So generally 0.80 uh, and above are considered high, uh, and you can see the AUC curves for all of these listed up here are effective. Now I have had a, um, a couple questions coming through with the chat box about other assessments that aren't listed on here. Yes, absolutely a lot of assessments can be applied to this type of a framework. The reason I'm showing you this slide is because uh, we at Pearson actually did assessments, uh, did studies on these assessments. So you're seeing data um, that shows that these specific assessments are effective at screening students. So yeah, there are others out there um, that absolutely could be fit into this model, um, but I'm just showing you what we completed here at Pearson. So what I propose is a, a two-stage method, and more of a hybrid screening method that incorporates the performance assessments and the, the ratings assessment. The important thing to remember is that we, we, we have to identify children who are having difficulty first before uh, we go too far into, into uh, this, the diagnostic process, right? It, if a child's not having any difficulty reading, then going into the diagnostic process doesn't make any sense. So to start this out, my suggestion is to incorporate this type of a two-stage screening method, which is look at targeted probe data to determine whether or not they have difficulty. So really what that does is it shows us who's having difficulty reading. It really validates that first question. So who is having, or where, where is that poor reading performance coming up? A, a, an example of that would be Ames Web Plus, for example. So if you're using Ames Web Plus and it has probe data, um, and you see after the second collection that the child is still continuing to have difficulty or even after the first um, is showing uh, some specific difficulty in areas related to reading, then yes, that's showing us that the child is having difficulty. We want to be able to find that first to limit over-identification. The second part of this method or the second stage would be to use the Shaywitz dyslexia screen, which is a rating measure after six to eight weeks, allows us to look at who is at risk specifically for dyslexia. Remember how I said earlier, some of the symptoms can be due to a lot of different reasons. Um, this, is, this, is another, this is another reason for us to be more specific about our, our screening, which is a child, uh, child might have difficulty reading, um, but it might not be due to 
include dyslexia. At this stage, if we have data that's showing us that a child is, is exhibiting poor reading performance, if we are um, if we are using or we input insert a specific screener for dyslexia, um, really highlighting the questions and the components that differentiate between at risk and not at risk for dyslexia, this makes it hot, much more specified in our analysis. So essentially, you can use the probe data then to continue to progress monitor and, and reassess those kids who need further, you know, might need further diagnostic assessment or intervention, et cetera. So that's my, my proposal is to have this two stages, and it really does allow us then to cut down on the over-identification of kids with, uh, with reading difficulties, kind of going into that dyslexia um, um, bucket. Once a child is, uh, is identified in that screening process, where we have, uh, we, they come up as being at risk for dyslexia, then you know, providing additional interventions is important. But moving on to the assessment process, the, uh, the more diagnostic assessment process is important. So let's think about diagnostic assessment needing uh, to be done in three general areas. Academic achievement, so diagnostic academic achievement, cognitive assessment, and uh, oral language assessment. The first category, I'll show you here are some key areas for dyslexia. These are primary areas. So there are, um, we have primary and secondary, as I mentioned earlier in, in the definition, right, of what are some primary and secondary deficits. But on the left-hand side, in the left-hand column, these are key areas um, that um, not only us here at Pearson, but other um, researchers across the reading world highlight as being important for us to analyze in the process of our evaluation. So we can see phonics, uh, letter knowledge, decoding pseudo words, word reading, word fluency, spelling, et cetera, all the way down to the to auditory working memory. And these are going to be considered primary areas that we can assess using, um, um, uh, using specific diagnostic achievement batteries. And up here at the top, you can see that the, the test that I've listed that will contribute there. So if I'm going to pull out something like the, the KT3, the Kaufman Test of Education Achievement third, third Edition, um, I would have tests in every single area to be able to assess these primary areas. It can contribute to this battery using more than one test. So a lot of times, I like to pull tests from different batteries. At some level, I might pull out the KT3 just because it's more comprehensive. But then I might pull into that the WORMP3 because it is a specialized reading assessment. I may also pull in the process of assessment of the learner because um, Virginia Berninger, the author, has a significant um, processing component built into her test. So then I can bring in other components as well. So really, if you think about this as a toolkit, I, I want to be able to show you that you can pull in multiple assessments to address each of these areas. But if you have a diagnostic assessment, it's important that you account for each of these areas as they are developmentally appropriate. So the question that always comes up is, well, which test should I give? I'm going to go back and tell you that you should look at the referral data, what's coming, what data do you have already, and what, uh, what grade is the child. So a lot of times, I don't want to look at certain areas if they don't make sense developmentally. So reading fluency, for example, is not something that I'm going to look at for young, young kids. I may not look at reading fluency until later in first or second grade um, because we know that fluency is going to be affected in kids who have deficits in the basics of reading. Um, so, so a lot of times I won't look at that. Um, even if I'm looking at something like, um, uh, if I'm looking at something like uh, uh, auditory working memory, I want to be able to take into account how many or how old the child is. Working memory assessment has come a long way, uh, but in young, young kids, I necessarily I wouldn't necessarily start looking at that yet. Um, I might look at that as a child just in the kindergarten or first grade. So anyway, you want to be able to take this into consideration when you're selecting what tests you're going to use. And if we look at the secondary areas here, again, this chart here does show us looking at reading comprehension, listening comprehension, orthographic processing, and where we can find that data, um, either on, on any of these four tests that I have listed up here at the top. I did mention something called the dyslexia index score. Um, you know, for example, this is an example of, of how you can compute that using the KT3. Um, dyslexia index score for grade K through one is going to include three subtests. Okay, and, and this uh, dyslexia index score can be a, an important data point for you to drive um, your diagnostic assessment. If you look at the effect size, 
um, and the, 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 uh, the, the reliability and the differentiation between the effective group and the max control group, you can see that it is highly effective at differentiating between um, children with and without dyslexia. So um, I, I mention this because it's a great uh, new addition to our um, professional toolkit. Um, right now, you can only find that in the Essentials of KT3 and Y3 book um, that Wiley publishes. Um, but I have that listed here if you want to go look at that, um, that data. The next part of the, the assessment process would look at cognitive assessment. So again, going to look at those processes that, um, that are super important in determining the causes of correlates. Um, I hear, here I have listed the WISC-5. Now, I absolutely agree that there are other assessments out there, the NEPC-2, um, the WJ, the, uh, the, the, the um, um, uh, there are, uh, the DAS, uh, there are tons of them out there that can give you data in each of these areas. So you want to be able to make sure you account for auditory working memory, rapid automatic naming, uh, visual co or verbal comprehension and reasoning, again, processing speed, that memory component and associative memory. Um, but I give you this for the WISC-5 because the WISC-5 does have measures for each of these areas of processing. So it's important for you to think about each of these areas, but again, you have to take into consideration the child that you're evaluating. So you may not look at each of these areas specifically, but think about those three key areas that IDA um, suggests we, we uh, incorporate into every evaluation, which are auditory working memory, rapid automatic name, and phonological processing. So uh, again, those are important key components, uh, key components to your assessment process. And then uh, finally, we here we have the diagnostic assessment of oral language. So for those SLPs on the call here, this should look quite familiar to you because I'm pulling in data from the HELP-5, uh, Clinical Evaluation of Language Fundamentals, fifth edition. So I get a lot of questions. Um, hey, Adam, um, how do we account for multiple professions in an assessment process? Well, this is a perfect example. When you have concerns with language or concerns with oral language, this is a key piece for your dyslexia evaluation. So speech and language pathology, in fact, I'm uh, with Tina, I'm doing a, a, a talk at um, ASHA coming up this week, at the end of this week, on, um, on um, the teaching of or um, dyslexia um, evaluation and learning in speech and language pathology. It is absolutely an area where speech and language pathology can link with and should link with education and psychology to find and to round out the assessment process and be more comprehensive. So I pulled these tests up here to show you where the self five can bring can be brought in for the diagnostic process, and um, absolutely you can um, integrate these into your assessment findings to be much more um, comprehensive and to make sure that you're accounting for um, each of the areas that could cause uh, weaknesses in reading overall. I love this. Uh, you can find this chart in the white paper that I mentioned earlier. But the reason I love this is because it brings out the symptoms, as I mentioned earlier, the causes and correlates, the risk factors, and the possible strengths. And it gives you a nice little chart to, uh, to highlight and to write down and track um, a child's assessment um, uh, process, a, a child's assessment uh, history. So you can track whether or not it's an area that you uh, find them to be at risk or not at risk. Um, what were their, were they below average, average, or high average? What source did you come at? Uh, what source did you find that with? So it's important that you, you can integrate this into your assessment. I think that you'll, you'll organize it much better. But each of these areas are listed out here um, based on the sections that I talked about earlier. And then again, to round out the SAIM process is um, we're going to go out to intervention, which is next. So after we assess those processes, we have to be able to intervene. These are examples of Pearson interventions. Again, there are many more. These are just ones that are brought out from Pearson that we either distribute or, or develop. Um, Spell Links um, has two processes, the, or two, two different interventions, reading and writing, and then class links for classrooms. Um, there is an intervention guide for learning disability subtypes that's available um, through the Q Global system in Pearson. Uh, the process assessment of the learner test also has research-based reading and writing lessons. And KT3 and Y3 also have teaching objectives and intervention statements. Um, and, and when I teach about, when I teach other professionals about these intervention statements, it's amazing what you can do when you do error analysis. 
So if you're familiar with giving tests like the KC3 and Y3, if you do error analysis enough and you integrate error analysis into those assessments, you come out with very effective objectives and intervention statements and goal statements. So that really does help um, with, with, with linking assessment to intervention. But these are just some examples that I wanted to bring for you. And then finally, really thinking about progress monitoring, I'm going to bring in two things, uh, two different data points here. One is going to be uh, the data, data that I mentioned earlier from Ames Web Plus. And then I'm going to mention a new system or newer system, which is evaluating standard scores and growth scale values together. And if you're not sure with what those are, um, stay tuned for a couple minutes and, I'll, and I'll, I'll go into them. I think they're really, really cool to hear about. But if I'm using a process, you may not use AIMSWEB in your district, but if you, if you do, um, this is a process that should be pretty familiar to you. Um, if not, you have probably are using some other um, benchmarking um, system or something that uses probes across time. But essentially what you would do in this situation is you would give these probes over time and be able to track a student's progress from time one to time two. So using a system like this can help you determine whether or not a child is improving um, in a specific skill based on the interventions that you're providing or the different instruction that you're providing. So using probe data, um, using benchmarking data is, is an absolutely an effective way um, for you to track progress over time. But if you're incorporating standardized assessments, uh, norm reference assessments, like the KT, like the Wyatt, like uh, um, the Woodcock Reading Mastery Test, they have many of those tests will have growth scale values incorporated into that finding. So what I want to show you um, is how you evaluate growth scale values with, re with uh, relationship to standard scores to track progress. Historically, norm reference standardized assessments were thought to not be very good at tracking progress over time, uh, which, is, which is, has been true over time. And the reason is because if you're using standard scores alone, to look at progress from time one to time two, um, they can be misleading oftentimes. The reason is because standard scores are de dependent on the, 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 the sample group, the norm sample. Um, so it really is dependent on how fast or how slow um, a, a norm sample develops or uh, establishes a skill. What the growth scale value does is it compares a child's performance against himself from time one to time two, it's not dependent on the norm sample. So you're looking at an equal interval scale, um, looking at ability uh, across the developmental continuum. So as a skill develops, the growth scale value will increase um, from time one to time two, or it'll, 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 it'll flatten out if it doesn't increase quickly. But it is, it's representative of how fast a child develops a specific skill, okay? So we can look at individual progress, looking at the evaluation of interventions over time. Here's an example of what it looks like uh, to think about it with regard to developmental change. So this is the total reading score, uh, the median GSV score um, on the Woodcock Reading Mastery Test, uh, which is just an overall evaluation of reading. And you can see that from first grade all the way through 12th grade, we see a steady progression of skill development. However, we see a much steeper learning curve from between grades one and grade four. And of course that makes a lot of sense. And then it, it tends to um, flatten out a little bit. It makes sense that we see the greatest increases in skill in GSV from grade one to grade four because that's when children are learning to read. Uh, so the total reading score on the, on the Woodcock Reading Mastery Test is a reflection of that, right? So this is what GSV does, is it shows us how much a child increases from time one to time two. You can say, hey, Adam, what does it matter? How much, how much of an increase in GSV it was a set of child is progressing? That does not matter. If a child increases at all in growth scale value from time one to time two, that means that their skill went up. Um, the way that you make that meaningful is to interpret growth scale values in light of standard score changes. So I have a couple scenarios here to help us understand this a little bit better, um, and I think that this will really help out. So. If we're looking at, again, we're focusing on progress monitoring. We're focusing on determining whether or not a child is making progress. So if I'm pulling these tests out, a letter word recognition test, at time one, a child gets a standard score of 79, okay, which, is, which is well below well below average, well below what we would expect. Um, and their growth scale value was 429. 
let's say we gave this test again, let's say six months later, their standard score turned out to be 85 and their growth scale value 520. What that shows us is that this child increased their skill in letter word recognition from time one to time two. We can see that. It went up. And if we interpret that in light of the standard score, it went up faster than their peer group because their standard score increased from time one to time two. And let's look at scenario two to help us uh, learn that a little bit more clearly. We see that in letter naming facility, time one, 75, time two was also 75. However, we see that the child's skill increased from time one to time two. So their GSV went up from 482 to 515, showing us that the child's letter naming went up from time one to time two. But it went up at the same speed as their peers because the, their standard score did not change um, from time one to time two. And they still remained well below their peers um, at the second evaluation phase. The next scenario would look at a decrease in standard score from time one to time two. So if we look at reading comprehension and we see their standard score went down, um, that means that they progressed much slower than their peers, even though we see a growth scale value increasing. So this child is still improving in the reading comprehension, but they're just improving much slower than their peers are. And this is a child that I would be concerned, depending on their age, that would fall further and further behind. And then the final two scenarios would look at a decrease in standard score um, from time one to time two in both of these situations. And in the top situation for word reading, we see that the growth scale value did not change, which means that this child's not gaining any additional word reading skills over time and they're falling further and further behind their peers. This is a child that I would get very, very, very concerned about because they're falling further and further away from their peer group, and they'll just continue to do so. And in this bottom one, much less common when you see a skill um, drop off, but in these situations, um, oftentimes it's from medical conditions, brain injuries, so, and so forth, where actual skill is being lost, okay? So that's what it looks like to interpret GSV and standard scores um, in light of each other to, to drive your progress monitoring and make it that much more effective. Now I have a couple of really cool scenarios, some screening scenarios um, that I wanted to talk about because I know you're all here to think about how to incorporate this assessment process into your school system and how it would fit. But these are some good scenarios that are, uh, are listed out, um, that the authors listed out in the dyslexia white paper that I think are really great for you to, to, to mull over. So to chew them over and to see how well it, you know, each of these scenarios may fit. And there are other scenarios as well, but these, are, these provide some really great framework. So in the first scenario, um, Ames Web Plus, but just for example, Ames Web Plus or any benchmarking system would be administ administered to all students as a screener, and low performance on this, this benchmark would then be further screened using the Shea with Dyslexia screen, which is kind of what I mentioned earlier. Those students identified as at risk would then uh, be administered three subtests from the KT3 brief to obtain the composite score, which is then that additional level um, to drive um, uh, your understanding of who is truly at risk and which, which students who are having difficulty in the benchmarks then we would consider significantly at risk for dyslexia. And then based on those results, it's important that teams determine the most appropriate intervention approach. You should never just leave students at, at this number two here um, without intervention. You should absolutely start intervention at this point. If you have a screening process that's identifying students who are at risk, those children should be put into more appropriate interventions or, um, or educational um, systems or educational processes. From that, from that point forward, you, you would use your benchmarking system to, to progress monitor and determine if you need to, to adjust the intervention. Um, and the children who are not responding to intervention should then move into the diagnostic process that I mentioned earlier. Uh, multiple disciplines in, uh, incorporating language, achievement, ability, cognition into that process, so incorporating uh, the, the evaluation and intervention processes of multiple disciplines in your building, and then determine if those tests, based on the process that I laid out in this, the, the previous hour that I've been talking, uh, to, to most effectively identify those children with, with dyslexia. The second scenario in, in, in this, uh, this school B, which is called school B, would be to implement a universal screening process using the JWITS first, which would identify those children who are at risk um, 
risk, at, at risk for dyslexia, and then follow up using a behavioral or behavioral slash performance screener. So giving the three tests to those children um, from the KT3 to de determine the dyslexia index score would be a great way to determine uh, those children who are not only at risk for dyslexia given a, uh, a, a rating form, but then also given a performance measure to, to show who uh, we should follow up with next processes. So following this two-step screening process, um, you should really, again, supplement, um, supplement instruction using multilinguistic studies, uh, study programs, um, determine whether or not that child should go further in the evaluation process. But again, remember, if you're not, if you don't have some level of change in your system for that child at the screening level, um, then you're not at an effective level. You're not providing effective instruction. You're not effectively addressing this child's needs. So it's important that after screening, we start to intervene some way, monitor progress, and then determine whether or not um, further assessment needs to be completed. In this scenario, at number three, um, you know, using curriculum-based based measurement to track progress, well, you could also use growth scale values after a couple weeks or after a couple months to determine whether or not the child is making progress on um, tests from the KT3. And then moving into uh, more comprehensive evaluation for those students who, after that second um, evaluation phase, um, still have difficulties, you can, you can move then into a more comprehensive level of assessment. So, you know, that's the end of our hour, right? So I'm really happy that you all participated for this past hour. And I want to thank Tina. She uh, has been answering all of the questions that you put through in the chat box. And again, if you have any questions, please feel free to, to, to put them in there. I have another minute, so let me see if there are any left here. Um, so. A uh, question came through with, uh, we're talking about tests that are using to determine learning disabilities and also use to screen. If we give too often, isn't there an issue of validity? So that, that question, Maury, is a good one, uh, which is that if you are in a process uh, more closely aligned with the second scenario that I pro uh, provided here, the second scenario here, um, I would never suggest you to give the screening compo uh, compartments or the, the screening measures um, and then quickly follow up with the diagnostic section or the diagnostic assessment. So there should be time between one and two. If you're giving that as part of a screener, um, or if you're giving the KT3 dyslexia index score as your screening method, then um, you know you should have a good bit of time between then to determine whether or not the interventions that you are um, instituting are effective or not. Um, and then, you know, after after three, four, five, six months, you can use the alternate um, uh, the alternate form. Um, absolutely, can do that and, and not 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 affect um, the, the test scores um, significantly. But then, moving to a different assessment could be another way to address that as well. So, yeah, it's a good good question. Um, but make sure that you have enough time in between there to determine if interventions are effective. All right, everybody, we're done with our hour. Um, Again, thanks again for coming. I hope that this, uh, this last hour was helpful for all of you. And feel free to send me an email if you have any questions or visit our website at pearsonclinical.com for more information about some of the tests that I talked about during the, uh, during the session. Have a great afternoon and uh, enjoy the rest of your week.